the summer's hottest concert series is back. Jazz at the Shed takes place every Wednesday night, now through September 14th, at Shed Aquarium. Enjoy a night of live music from premier jazz musicians, breathtaking skyline views from Shed's lakeside terraces, food, drinks, 32,000 aquatic animals, and complete fireworks show. Tickets are on sale now at ShedAquarium.org slash Jazzin. Become a member today and receive free admission. Jazzin at the Shed is sponsored by Chase. Blog Talk Radio. This March is Women's History Month in the U.S., and we've got a treat for you all the way in the U.K. We have Hannah Lowe. She's a poet and a prose writer. She's published two pamphlets, The Hitcher and Rx. Her first full collection, Chick, was shortlisted for the Forward Best First Collection Prize and the Aldenburg Fenton Best Selection. Her memoir, Long Time No See, is forthcoming in 2014. She's currently studying for her Ph.D. in creative writing, alongside freelance teaching for the poetry school and elsewhere. As usual, my co-host, Chris Daly, he will be doing the interview. So take it away, Chris. Thanks, Denise, and welcome, Hannah. It's good to dialogue with you this afternoon. Hello. Yeah. Well, we'd like to get to your audience to know you a little. So you have a very special and unique uh, Jamaican root. It's rich with a blend of both Chinese and black. Tell us a little about this. Okay, no problem. Um, my father was born in Jamaica in Paris of St. Thomas in 1925, and his father was Chinese. So my surname, Lo, is a Chinese surname. His father was called Lo Xuan. And he had come to Jamaica from China in 1918 or 1920. Um, my father's mother was 15 when she had my father, and she was black Jamaican. And she was um, a servant in my grandfather's shop. He was a Chinese shopkeeper, as many of the Chinese in Jamaica were and still are. And so there was never a, a loving relationship between them. Um, and my father um, grew up with his father uh, working in that shop. His mother, um, he was really estranged from her. Um, and so my dad came to Britain in 1947, and uh, after a while went my mum, who is white and English. So that's my mix. Wow, that's a very interesting and challenging situation. So how did your dad make this thing work for you to, to give you your identity? Well, my dad definitely identified with the black Jamaican culture more than he did with the Chinese. And I think that isn't just because he never visited China and didn't grow up in China, but I think it was really because he had a very difficult relationship with his father quite an abusive relationship. And so my father really never spoke about being uh, part Chinese. He only ever really spoke about being Jamaican, which for him meant black. But where the Chinese, I think, manifested itself most strongly in my childhood was through food. Because even though my dad didn't um, speak about his Chinese identity, he loved to cook Chinese food. He used to make these sausages Chinese sausages that he would hang on our washing line to dry for a week and uh, he'd like to drink Chinese tea and uh, he was always cooking um, Chinese food. Um, the Jamaican, black Jamaican culture was more prevalent perhaps in his um, like for music, you know, he liked reggae music and also again through Jamaican food and also his friends. My dad was an avid gambler and he had a lot of uh, Jamaican cronies that he'd come and visit okay. him. <laughs> yeah. So how was it, you know, you, you, where you grew up as um, give, being a, a child of um, mixed race, how was the acceptance in the wider community at the time mm -hmm. for you, for yourself? 
Well, you, you have to understand, I mean, we're on the radio, so you, could, you can't see what I look like, but I look white, <laughs> and you wouldn't mistake me for being, you wouldn't think I was part black or part Chinese. And so, really, that is a, a, a crucial sort of foundational moment in my identity is the fact that I don't look mixed race and yet in some ways I feel that I have a, a claim to a mixed race identity. It's always very tentative though, it's very, really, very complicated. I grew up in a household that seemed to me to be mixed race in the sense of there being a presence of three cultures um, and yet outside of the house I was never treated doing anything but white. Um, yeah. So I was constantly having to explain my father to people, not only because he was um, black, but also because he was so much older than other fathers. He was 52 when he had me. So he was really quite an old man by the time I was a teenager. And I was embarrassed of him. You know, I had to put my hands up and say that um, I sometimes said uh, that he was the cab driver when he used to come and pick me up from ballet classes, just because you, I wanted to be accepted and to fit in. Um, I didn't want to have to explain him away. So the acceptance by the wider culture is an interesting thing. It wasn't about acceptance. It's about the fact, really, I was kind of whitewashed. I guess that's a better way of putting it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, it's only really through writing um, that I've started to make a claim on uh, a different sort of identity. So how did you come to discover, the, as I said, you have a powerful pen. How did you come to discover this gift and this passion of writing? Well, it's lots of things, really. I mean, I think as a child, I'd really loved um, music and uh, painting and those sorts of things. But I hadn't really loved writing. But when I sort of, as you get older, I become a teenager, you kind of give up your hobbies and stuff. And I, I always missed painting and music and that kind of thing and for me poetry writing poetry um has elements of those two things very very strongly so i think the poems i write are very visual and i like to think they've got a quality of music but i didn't start writing anything until i was 29 um two events happened one was i was teaching in a in a college and i was teaching english i'm an english teacher I was teaching an anthology of poetry and I found myself increasingly kind of interested in the craft of writing. It was a, an anthology of a thousand years of English poetry. And also my mum gave me an anthology of contemporary poetry at that time. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh, I want to write like this. But none of this would have happened unless I'd had the subject matter. And the subject matter was really the fact that my father had died when I was 22. And I felt very regretful that I hadn't asked him more about his life and I hadn't been more interested in his life when he was alive. Just as I was getting interested in him and all these issues around identity, he died. But for, for some years after that, I carried around what I, what I would call a grief that I hadn't explored that. And so once I started writing, every poem I wrote was about my dad. It was a running joke in a creative writing class I was going to. Oh, Hannah brought in another dad poem. Um, and, and in the end, I wrote a whole book of, of dad poems. She's the book. Well, I'm seeing at the cover of the book right now, the title of the book is Chick. And I know you'll explain that for us for a minute, but as the, the, the picture of a book, the cover of a book is usually very intriguing. And here is a picture of your handsome dad, and he's holding a baby in his hand. Very tender picture. Um, but it's not you. It's your brother. <laughs> Tell us about this picture. It's your brother, Hampstead. Yeah. It's my it's my half-brother. Actually, it's the son from my dad's second marriage, because I'm the child of my dad's third marriage. Taken in 1954 in Hampstead. The reason I chose this photo, one, it looks, so absolutely English because it's got a big chimney in the background. And I wanted, I guess I wanted it to sort of challenge the idea that England or Britain was, you know, was, uh, it was never what only white, you know. So historically I wanted to kind of show this picture of my father, a black man on a roof in London. But also, at the time the picture was taken, there were lots of headlines, pictures circulating in the media of white women holding 
mixed race children looking very forlorn, as though they'd been abandoned. And the headlines would say things like, would you let your daughter marry a Negro? And so the reason I chose this picture is because it so counteracts that idea. It shows a black man with a, a, a white-looking child. Um, and in the photos, the black man is a nurturer. It's a tender photo, as you say. And I wanted to make clear that that is one of the themes of the book, is uh, about how my father was a nurturer in his own ways. It wasn't without... They, it, his, his fathering wasn't without problems, but he was a nurturing dad. Clearly an influence over you for you to dominate your writing so much that you'd write an entire book of poems on it. What did you discover as you uh, looked into writing about your dad that um, you want to capture here in this series of poems? Well, it's really the main mystery around my father, aside from the kind of the fact that I knew so very little about his childhood in Jamaica, was the fact that my dad was a, was a professional gambler. And he never did any other work other than gambling. He would disappear off out the house after dinner at 6 o'clock, say, and often not be back when I woke up to go to school. Um, I knew that he played cards, but I didn't know um, the extent of um, his gambling or the fact that he was so highly regarded. It was at his funeral that all of a sudden these sort of dodgy looking fellas turned up telling me that my dad was one of like the best poker players in London and a masterful dice player and so on and so on. But my dad also had a saying, which was, if you can't win it straight, win it crooked. By which I mean that he was also a card sharp, a cheat. It's morally ambiguous, I know, but it wasn't without skill. But I found all this out after he had died. And so much of my writing is about sort of recovery work, finding out well, exactly what was my dad doing in the East End of London? How did he cheat? And I was aligning what I, would, what I found out, particularly from interviews with my mother, but also to kind of broader research about gambling with what I remember from childhood. So, for example, in our hall cupboard, to the back, behind all the coats and scarves, was a box full of dice and also marker pens and razor blades. There was a tiny little guillotine, which I now know was for shaving the side um, of a card so that he could feel it when he was playing. And there was also a dentist drill with which he loaded dice. He would drill out the, the white holes and then load them with lead. So all of the kind of the, the writing um, that I've done has really come from this this sort of detective work, I guess, going back and trying to find out more about my father. This is just marvelous, those kind of insights. So you want people to really consume this book. What do you want your audience to take away from this series of poems for themselves? Well, I hope they enjoy them as poems, I mean, first and foremost, and I hope that um, they become interested in my father. It's not just my father I, I wanted to write about, but one of my reasons for wanting to write about him is that he was a marginalised figure in Britain because of the racism that faced his generation of migrants coming from the Caribbean in the post-war period to Britain. A lot of them experienced um, racism in terms of housing and in terms of employment, but also popular racism, racism on the streets. My dad never spoke about his experience of that, but I can't imagine that he'd lived in Britain uh, from 1947 and not experienced it. He grew, grew up in colonial Jamaica with a great respect for the institutions of Britain, and yet they were institutions to which he had no access. I, I feel that my father, in a different time and place, was a clever man, was a, was a skilled, intelligent and well-read man, might have been a politician or a mathematician, might have been a poet himself. But as it was, he was a marginalised figure who gambled for a living. And I wanted to make his story, which is one of migration and um, upheaval and survival, important um, to, to an audience. I wanted people to know about him. But I also wanted to put him within the context of that generation 
of um, post-war Caribbean migrants coming to Britain, not all of them were just passive victims. They weren't all naive um, or innocents arriving in England. Many of them, um, I think, like my father, were also sort of maverick figures. They were adventurers as well. Two things are true at once. There was a sort of victimhood, but there was also a sense of these men imposing themselves onto a new landscape. If that makes sense. That's really marvellous. Give us a taste of your writing. I think you got us on, the, on, on, the, on our chair, at the edge of our chair. Can you share a little of one of your poems? Yeah, I'll give you... Um, I'll read some of a poem called Three Treasures, which is a poem about growing up in a household where the English, Jamaican and Chinese cultures were visible and present in, in different ways. Um, I should say that um, my nan, my mother's mother, lived with us, and my nan was a right old racist. She'd moved from the east end of London out to Essex to escape, as she would call, the bleeding immigrants. And yet, Right on her heels to Ilford, where we grew up, were the immigrants because it was a cheap place to live. And in the end, she ends up living in a house uh, where she lived on the, on the ground floor and my mum and my father lived above. So the fact that she tried to escape the immigrants and ended up living below a black man always struck me as being a heady irony. Um, so she featured in this poem as well. Three treasures. Jamaica in the attic in a dark blue trunk sea salt in the hinges what must it look like all that wide blue sea england downstairs in a rocking chair nana rocking with her playing cards cigs and toffee tepid tea jamaica frying chicken in the kitchen pig snout in the stew pot breakfast pan of salt fish and ackee china in the wonton skin gold songbird in the brittle porcelain pink pagoda silk settee England eating peaches on the patio, hopscotching, a mum in wellies, sacateurs around the rosebush and the raspberries. England for the English in graffiti on the roundabouts and bus shelters, please so on TV. Jamaica on the phone at 3am, my father's back home voice through fuzz and crack, my friend long time no see. China, in the Cantonese he knew but wouldn't speak in letters stuffed in shoeboxes, ink stick calligraphy. China, in his slender bones, in coral birds of stitch bamboo. China, in an origami butterfly that flew. Thank you so much. That was powerful and very vivid. Thank you. Tell our audience how they can get a hold of this fine piece of work. <laughs> well, Chick, the uh, poetry collection, is available from the publisher's website, which is Blood Axe Books, um, and it's also available on Amazon, uh, you know, in the US and uh, in Europe. Um, so that's the way. <laughs> also, there's some poems online. If you Google my name, um, you find my website where you'll find some of these poems. They're elsewhere on the internet. Go ahead and tell us what your website is. It's www.hannahlow.com. Org. That's L O W E dot org. Okay. Yes, yeah, org exactly. Wonderful. You're currently working on your PhD in creative writing, and I know you're working another book to be out this year. How will you be using this talent going forward? Well, I'm now writing two books. One is finished. One is a, a family memoir that travels between um, my, uh, the location of my upbringing in, in the 1980s. Now, the 1980s in Britain were a very interesting time in terms of race and politics. We had an awful uh, conservative sort of equivalent to a Republican, harsh Republican government. And um, there was all kinds of stuff going on politically in the 1980s. So some of it is about growing up during that period. And I kind of parallel it with um, my father's upbringing in Jamaica in the late 20s and 30s. My dad became very involved before he left Jamaica in independent politics. Um, he wanted uh, Jamaica to be um, to lose its kind of colonial governance and govern itself. And so the book parallels these two stories of my my upbringing and my father's upbringing, and then tells the story of his journey. So it's quite different from 
Chick, the poetry book, which is really just about mine and my father's relationship. So that book will be out um, at the end of uh, this year. And I'm also working on a second poetry collection that, again, takes family ancestry as its origin, but really traces out much, much further. I've become quite interested in the Chinese heritage. The fact that all the Chinese in Jamaica are ethnically uh, called Hakka, they're from, that, they're from the Hakka region of China, and many of the, of, Chinese, of the Chinese migrants throughout the world are Hakka people. And so I began to look at tracing back um, the story of the Hakka and how they, even within China, the Hakka are migrants that have come from one place to another. And Hakka really means guest people. So how the Hakka have moved throughout the world, particularly to... Um, Jamaica. So that's my, my new sort of point of interest. Will it be without the derogative like a gypsy like uh currency or Yeah, I suppose it's a similar thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, at, at one time the word hacker was was an insult. It meant outsider. But the hacker kind of replaced mm-hmm. that word, I think, and it became a, a gentler term, a more positive term about for guest people. And where, wherever the hacker go, they seem to do quite well. And so in Jamaica, the hacker have been very industrious in terms of business. Many of them are, 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 are shopkeepers. But there's a whole culture that goes, um, you know, with, with um, the hacker. And it's interesting, in Jamaica, the Chinese uh, in Jamaica themselves, and it's three generations on, they're very interested in their own um, origins back in China. So you can now kind of do a hacker tour uh, the Chinese Jamaicans travel back to China to find out more about their origins as well. So I was thinking maybe I'm going to go back to Jamaica and jump on the hacker tour bus, go back to China, maybe. <laughs> That's powerful. Uh, roots roots matter to us. We always, as humans, want to know what our roots are. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, Hannah, any final word of wisdom as we close? Well, I suppose... Um, one thing, I was in a, a panel discussion last night about writing about family ancestry. And someone said something very wise, which is that it's always at the moment when you can't ask anymore that you want to know. So in terms of your own, one's own family history, it's always uh, often after someone has died that so all of a sudden you think, oh, I want to know this. And then you think, oh, if only I'd ask them when they were alive. And I would give, you know, pretty much anything to have an hour now or two hours chatting to my dad, you know, to fill in the still substantial gaps in his story and, and the story of my family ancestry. So I suppose my words of wisdom are to your listeners, ask the questions now while you have the chance and then you'll know more about, you know, your own story and where you came from. What a powerful piece of wisdom to end on. Thank you so much, Anna, for spending some time with us and sharing this journey and for your powerful imaginative pen that Thank has you. taken us into a new and it, new place. You're and welcome. to learn more about Jamaican Diaspora, visit JamaicanDiaspora.com. And if you click... Um, Jamaican Dice for Amazon on that website. You can actually purchase the book Chick there. To learn more about Chris Daly, visit myheartmemories.com. And to learn more about Hannah Lowe, visit hannahlowe.org. Thanks, Hannah. Bye now. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Boar's Head invites you to enlighten your senses. Introducing Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki-style chicken. Inspired by Japanese master chefs, our signature teriyaki glaze is crafted with garlic, ginger, and a hint of brown sugar. Then paired with our tender, slow-roasted chicken breast for a flavor that's sweet, savory, remarkably bold. Boar's Head Ichiban Teriyaki-style chicken. The bold flavor of Japan. Now at the deli. Compromise elsewhere.